for one more. All right, is the path clear? N not really? <laughs> okay. Quiver, 10 through 13, follow General Pernak out. Alrighty, and Senior Quiver, you are dismissed. Yes, I know. I'm trying to figure out where my Brandon. Where I can't find the app. All right, thank you. Yeah. All righty, we're going to go ahead and get started. And if somebody will, Brandon, would we'll just close that door on your way out. And uh, before we get too far along, where's Al? Al, come up here, brother. Al wanted to share something. Yeah, so for those of you that were at Sukkot, and uh, came and enjoyed some uh, coffee and fellowship. We have mentioned that uh, we were given all the proceeds to uh, one of the wells, and uh, we raised seven hundred and fifty dollars. So, everybody in here did that. so Bill, how many? We paid for one full well, and we're on our. It's okay, so we're working on our third. Wow. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Al. Um, yeah, just to kind of bring you up to speed on that, if you're interested, how many of you are interested? All right, All right. you know that uh, Jacob's Tent uh, has been kind of participating in um, this effort by Paul Wilbur and his ministry to, to help the Limba tribe in Zimbabwe. And uh, if you want more information on, on all the details behind that, you can go to his website. But... Uh, he had shared with us back at Passover how uh, he was very interested in wanting to try to help these folks. And um, basically, they're just extremely poor, no clean water. Um, school children go to school in some very, very challenging circumstances. So we made the decision as a congregation that we wanted to at least fund one of those wells. So when he was here at Passover, we sent him home with a check for $20,000. And if you were at Sukkot or you watched it online, you saw the video of the, the drill uh, actually working on that very first well. And he had sent me a text saying that this is, um, this is the first well, you know, Jacob's Tent funded that very first well that was drilled. So when he was here at Yom Turua, of course, we just appealed to everyone. And within 24 hours, literally 24 hours, another $20,000 came in that was dedicated to support another well. And we are, okay. We are almost there to support a third one. Wow. So um, I'm really pleased that, that we get to participate in this. Um, just 
it's, it's a thrill. I mean, I, maybe that's not the right word to use, but that's the one that comes to mind. It's a thrill. It's a blessing to get to participate in. And I, I did get to see some other video that I haven't, um, I haven't shown you. I don't have it on my phone or I would. Um, when they were dancing in the streets, when the water was gushing up. And uh, <laughs> here's how they dance. <laughs> it was... It was a blessing and it was a hoot. And uh, so, it was, and it was worth it to see me do that. Okay. Now, you hush. But I would suspect that pretty soon we'll be sending them another check. Yes. Yes, that would help Heather out tremendously. So if you have funds that are going towards Zimbabwe, I did on the app, if you give on the app, if you choose benevolence on there, there's another drop down that appears and now Zimbabwe is actually in that. And that way it will help me find it easier. And then if you give on the website, just need to give it into the benevolence fund that's on there. There's a button for benevolence on there. And then in the comment section, write Zimbabwe. And that helps me find it so that I can make sure it all goes where it's supposed to go. Checks, it's fine to put that in the memo. And that's, that's totally fine and easy to find. But the other two are a little harder. So if you can help me out by doing that. Wonderful. I'll tell you my private, I haven't shared this with anybody. It is my private goal, hope, that Jacob's Tent will end up, before all is said and done, uh, sending about $100,000 to this, to this project. And that's a lot of money, but you know what? God's people have it, they, they've, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's 5,000 or five, you know, uh, it's just, um, it's just, very, very encouraging to see how God's people are, are supporting these kinds of things. And, and we get to be part of it. And we'll never, in this lifetime, never know the names of these people. But there will come a day that we'll get introduced to some folks. And they'll get introduced to us. And it'll just be a great blessing to know that we had a very, very, very small role to play in God blessing them. You know? And, uh, and it blesses us to be able to do that. Would you say amen to that? Amen. All right. So, um, again, it's, it's, I didn't pray about it and ask God to give me a figure or anything like that. It's just my, my, in my heart, my goal is that before all is said and done, and I'm not going to put a time limit on it. I'm just going to say it's my goal that Jacob's Tent can, in the end, at least send $100,000 to that kind of a project. So... Is it all right if I said that? I did it anyway, but uh, <laughs> anyway, you know, you have not because you ask not, right? Anyway, thanks, Heather, and let's see. Um, oh, yes, Jeannie. Pass, will you pass this mic back to Jeannie? Okay, so some of y'all saw me before Sukkot and during Sukkot, and now you're seeing me walk around on this cane, and you're thinking, what's happened? Well, September the 30th, I became very ill with a virus, probably shedding virus, okay? My son, I had taken Stephen to his reg some of his regular appointments, and he was in with these older people, and I know that they were vaccinated. You just know. And this guy comes out on the sidewalk, and he starts hacking up. Sounds like his lung. And I, told, I texted Stephen, I said, stay away from that man. There's something wrong with him. And I began to wonder what Stephen was going to bring back to the car. Well, the next day, I became very ill. I spent three or four days with fever. I have no idea what that temperature was. But I was laying in bed and I said, Father, this is not living abundantly. Either let me go or heal me. That's all I asked. So my fever was raging. I mean, 
I have a plate and I couldn't keep my teeth in my mouth because I was shivering so bad. And I said, Father, you got to get this fever down. And I went into the vision and I could see this pool of water in a golden basin. And I could feel the water coming up to my chin. And I could feel the fever leaving my body. And I could see this like a fiery cloud over the bathtub or over this basin. And it was like thunder went off. And it scared me. And now I had been in bed for three or four days in the same outfit, okay? A Jacob's tent hoodie <laughs> and a pair of leggings. That's what I lived in. And when I woke up, I woke up in my recliner and I was in my linen skirt and my linen blouse and my hair was slightly damp. And I heard a voice, my child, your fever is gone. I didn't put myself in that chair. I didn't have the strength. I couldn't even get out of bed. But Father healed me of that fever. And I went a few days later. My mom taught me going to a clinic. And I said, let's check your, check your temp. I said, it's normal. My fever was 102.5. They gave me a Z-Pack. I've had the Z-Pack, but I've been trying to get my strength back. So that's why I'm on the cane. I can't walk very far. But praise be to Father. He broke that fever that was so excessive that could have taken my life. And so I just want to say to everyone online and a few people that are in here that are on my Facebook that's been praying for me. I'm here. I'm walking. I walked a block and a half twice today because I asked Father to have the strength to come. And I want to thank everybody. But I'm just weak. And this, I'm on a cane until I can get my strength, until I can walk. But at least I'm not walking in my house holding on to the walls and crawling from my bathroom to my bedroom to my kitchen because, and I didn't eat. Bill, I finally got a fast. <laughs> well. For seven to 10 days, I didn't eat nothing. I couldn't eat anything. I couldn't hold anything down. But I finally got that fast. And I prayed for everybody here. I prayed for leadership. I prayed for everyone that I knew that needed prayer because I had decided if my last breath was a prayer, so be it. Let's everybody extend their hands toward Jeannie and let's pray for her and that the Father would just strengthen her even before she leaves today. Our Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, first of all, we want to thank you that you brought our sister through this, uh, this sickness. We thank you for being there with her when no one else could. We thank you for watching over. We thank you for uh, just bringing her to us here today. Father, we appeal to you now to finish what you started. We ask, Father, that you would bring strength to her body, that you would just revitalize her bones, her muscles, her ligaments and joints, and, and strength to her lungs, strength to her heart, and just revitalize her, we pray. And as she is resting and recuperating, we just pray, Father, that every step she takes, that she will grow stronger. We ask, Father, that tonight she'll be able to rest peacefully and she'll get up in the morning and feel a difference in her body. And we will thank you. We, we thank you in advance. We just believe you for these things. We're, we believe, Father, we're living in a day when you're going to do these things more often than what some of us have seen in times past. And not because we're anything special, but because it is the time for these things to begin to happen, that people will be drawn to you. And so we just pray for our sister again, that you'll bring strength and healing to her body in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you. All righty. So, folks, we're going to get started. And who would like to... Linda, you didn't even wait for me to ask. You already got the microphone. Go ahead. Well, it's about a snake. 
No. No more. No snakes. No snakes. I will stand up. No hissings in the. No hissing in the pit. This is a. This is a question that I saw on the live stream. Okay. Um, I think the name is Tara Ann Jowers. Uh, and she was talking about you had mentioned. Well, you went. You read the scripture, bear sheet, at Genesis 12. And uh, she asked Abram, she said, Abram was instructed to go yourself from your relatives. Did Abram disobey when he allowed Lot to travel with him? I don't really, I don't really see that. I mean, because apparently Lot chose to travel with him, you know, to go, to go along with him. It, my understanding is that they all left Ur. Terah stayed in Haran. And then, you know, the company moved on from there. I, I don't see it as that. I just see it as what we were discussing earlier. The father tells us to do something. Here's the objective. Here's the goal. But he doesn't throw, us, uh, throw it all on us at one time, most of the time, right? There are some things that are instantaneous. There are some things that unfold over time. Um, this is apples and oranges, but in my mind's connected. In Acts 15, when there was that big you know, hubbub about you got some non-Jewish people that are coming to faith and some people went in there and said, now, unless you're circumcised after the manner of Moses, you're not saved. And this causes a big commotion. And so the, the elders met in Jerusalem and they wrote a letter, right? And what was the letter? All right, look, guys, we're going to tell them some things to begin with because we're still grappling with these things. We are still trying to figure all these things out, and we grew up in this. These people didn't grow up in this. We can't overwhelm them. So we're going to give them a few things. We're going to tell them to abstain from the pollution of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. Because Moses, every week in the synagogue, every Sabbath day, Moses, the Torah, is taught. What is the implication in that statement? That over time, they will learn more and more and more and more. But we're going to give them a place to start. So I feel that that's the way the Father typically does things. If, you know, <laughs> I've been thinking about Brad a lot today, and he used to have this little thing, you know, that he, when he would teach, you know, and he's just all over the place and, you know, and, and just throwing a lot of things out. And he would say, I, I know that I'm coming at you with a fire hose, you know, and saying, open up, you know. And so his point was, it, a lot of it at one time can be overwhelming. I think our Father understands that we, being in the state we are, there's only so much we could absorb at one time. There's only so much we can learn at one time. I, that's how I see it anyway. Anybody disagree with that? All right. So, Robert, dis you disagree with it? No. <laughs> um, I, I so no. I don't. I don't see it that way. I just. It's a progression. And when Abraham heard the command, "Take your only son that you love to the top of Mount Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering," that's when God says, "Now I know that you're a man that fears me, and you're not going to withhold anything from me." That's the point that he'd reached. That that call to be Tamim. We read about that in Genesis 17. I'm El Shaddai. Walk before me and be perfect. Tamim. Well, he tells him that after some of these other things he's already told him. Right? I'm rambling, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, you don't look at me and raise your hand. Look at him. Now he's got, he's, okay. Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> so I had a, some comments and uh, that I wanted to share, and maybe you can give me insight of what you think or help me put my thoughts together on this, because I saw some uh, interesting parallels between how Abraham was called, or at the time, I guess it was Avram or Abram, um, when the phrase lech lecha is mentioned here, and it's not as if it was a suggestion by Yahweh, but more so of him, like they almost had, already had this type of relationship and he knew better to just go ahead and not hesitate on the idea that, hey, I should probably go or let me think about this first or how we would say today, well, let me pray about that and I'll get back to you. But more so about... Well, I would say, is that really you? <laughs> right. And so he's he goes in almost like in a, uh, an immediate sense, like he doesn't think about it or, or hang around. And in Matthew chapter 4, um, Yeshua goes around and he sees uh, Peter and Simon, or Simon Peter and Andrew, his brother, 
And instead of telling them at the time to, you know, go, it's more so, hey, come, follow me. And we're hearing this from Yeshua, the Father in the flesh, down here on earth. And we see both in the sense that uh, Abram had left a comfortable place. He left his jobs, his birthplace. He left a possible inheritance from his father. And we see that uh, Andrew and um, Peter, that they leave something very familiar and comfortable to them to go follow after the Messiah. And then I was looking just to try to look at the Strong's Concordance with some of their words, but I was using the Septuagint to try to see if any of the, there was any parallels or connections with what was being said in the Hebrew, because I don't have a Hebrew Matthew, but what maybe Yeshua was saying. And so I did find, um, for those who care to know on the live stream, Greek number 4198 is used in verse 4 of um, Genesis 12, where it says, So Avram went, and when Yeshua tells the disciples in Matthew 28 to go out to all nations, and that they're not to just hang out in Jerusalem, but they were to go all out to these other ends of the earth. And like Avram, he wasn't to just hang out where his home place was, but to go out to be a blessing as if we're the heirs of the seed of, of Abraham. So just some things I thought were pretty cool as I was reading back and through. And then connected to the prophet about um, Isaiah in chapter 49, verse 6, whenever, or maybe verse 9, I can't recall, but talking about Yeshua, but um, prophesying that he's going to make him a light to the nations for all people, that salvation may come. So just some interesting parallels that I had noticed reading throughout the Torah portion and the New Testament. Well, we shouldn't be surprised because, you know, the message has been the same from the beginning. You know, the people, the names change, sometimes even the places, but the, but the, the mandate is the same. You know, for instance, you know, Yeshua tells his disciples, to go out and to do what? Make disciples, right? To make disciples of all nations. You read in the Torah portion that when Abraham left Haran, he's still called Avram there, but when he left Haran, he didn't. He, he took his wife, he took Lot, his nephew, and all the people that they had, what's the word that's used there? Acquired, thank you. And so what does that mean? Well, a lot of commentators say he made disciples. You know, he was teaching about this one God, and he made disciples. That um, Eliezer of Damascus was, even though he was a, he was servant to Abraham, nevertheless he was one of those disciples who was learning about the God of Abraham. You know, so point being, we shouldn't be surprised to see the connections and the parallels, because the message has always been the same, right? Amen. All right, who's who's got the microphone? Yes, sir. When you have a daughter, do you have a daughter yet? Yes. You do? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All right. What's her name? Rebecca. Rebecca, okay. I was going to, never mind. I didn't know you had a daughter already. I'm sorry, forgive me. Was I going to name her Mike? Oh, I was thinking Penny, Penny. but anyway. <laughs> Penny Lane. Shh. Got it. Anyway. <clears throat> I, should, I should know that. <laughs> no, if, you, was, if you had thought about it, yeah. right now, I'm sorry. Um, don't mind me. Just ask your question. <laughs> Make your comment. Both Jubilees and Jasher record that Abram had, Abram had this relationship with his family, his father specifically, where he constantly challenged him about the idols. And then Jubilees records that one night he set the house of idols on fire. And as the community responded to the house, his brother Haran ended up dying in fighting that fire which is why I've always took that to mean that Abraham sort of realized, I had a good intention, I'm gonna burn the idols down. Unfortunately, my brother died, so now Lot is now my responsibility. So I've always kind of taken it to being that, assuming that the report is true from Jubilees and Joshua. So I was just gonna share that. It's possible why, that's why Lot it traveled with the them. question about did he sin? Right. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. just adding to that. Now, see, I read many years ago in the Sefer Agadah about, you know, the, the, the notion that Abraham, rather than setting the place on fire, he just broke all but the one idol. Well, that's a different story. It's a different story. Yeah. Right. Different tradition. Okay. All right. Who's next? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, this is going back to the question that Linda brought up from online. I saw that, and if it helps anybody process it, when I saw that, what I thought of is, 
um, I have a family. And for decades, I had, you know, Joshua posted to my door, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. My sons are here. My daughters aren't. Okay. I have no right to question their salvation. That's not my place. But I know they don't walk the same way we do. At the same time, I left my family. And they're walking whatever walk they're walking. But this is the part, that the point I want to make. My wife's sister and her husband have come along with us and are walking with us. So when it said leave my family, I don't leave them. They came with me. So, and I go back to, uh, and he said it on many different occasions, but just most recently in Noach, like you pointed out, um, when he said that the floodwaters came and all were destroyed, but Noah and his family were on the ark. So maybe all doesn't always mean all. Same thing goes with leave your family. Might not be all encompassing. <laughs> I think the point there, and I, I agree, the point there would be there are going to be family members who are not going to walk this walk. And that would be a detriment to you trying to walk this walk. But then there are maybe family members who are going to join you in this walk. All right, let me, let me read this one on the board. Um, if you were given a blood transfusion when you were deathly ill in the hospital years ago, and now you're on this walk, can you be forgiven? And does the blood given ever leave the body? Uh, the first part of the question is, can you be forgiven because you got a blood transfusion? I, look, I got a laundry list of things that I did before I was born again that will far <laughs> outweigh <laughs> what you got with a blood transfusion. And I'm convinced that I've been forgiven. So I don't even, th I, I don't think you, I think you need to be free from feeling that guilt or whatever word uh, applies there. I don't think you need to feel any condemnation about that. If you are in this walk, if you're born again, you know, we're all continuing to do things in ignorance. And as we learn, as we grow, the Father gives, uh, gives us information that we need to better ourselves and to draw closer to Him. And I'm thankful that in the process, He gives us grace you know, and that he is merciful, he's long-suffering. So I don't think you need to, I don't think you need to spend any more time worrying about that, frankly. As far as does the blood given ever leave the body, that is a medical question, and I slept through science, so I am not <laughs> going to try <laughs> to give an answer to that as far as the, you know, literal um, I will tell you something, and you can take this for what it's worth. The very first message I ever gave many, 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 many moons ago was about what happens when we're born again as it relates to the blood, because blood is a very important thing as far as atonement and redemption and these kinds of things. And it always intrigued me that Yeshua did not have an earthly father. The importance of that being that, like most of us inherit blood from a father. You know, there's the mother as well, but I'm, the point being it can all be traced back to Adam. Because when he fell, we were all, we, we were all born and shaped in iniquity. We, we were born into this world with a carnal nature. But there is something that takes place when we are a new creation. Something changes, right? We, are, we, we become a new creation. We're a new creature. All right, so when God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, he said he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living nephesh, living soul. We understand that the life of all flesh is where? In the blood. So it is at the very least hinted that when God breathed the breath of life into Adam for him to become a living soul, that he breathed blood into him as well. 
Because where did that blood come from? In fact, Luke says he was, Adam was the son of God. If you're tracing the genealogy back, here's my point. When Yeshua appeared to his disciples on the day of his resurrection, he said, receive the Holy Spirit, and he breathed on them. That Greek term shows up that time only in this emphaseo. And if you were to take that Greek term, emphaseo, he breathed on them, and then go to the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. There is only one place that you will find the term emphaseo used in all of the, the, uh, the Tanakh or the Hebrew Scriptures written in Greek. And it's in Genesis chapter 2 when God breathed the breath of life into man and he became a living nephesh. My point is I believe that something takes place, not just spiritually, but physically. Something begins to take place when we are born again and we are going undergoing a transformation one day that transformation will be complete when we see him as he is and this mortal puts on immortal this corruption puts on incorruption but i believe that it is initiated when we were born again if the day i stood up from Running after running to the altar, you know, I've been away from you for so long, God. I don't even know if you're hearing my prayer right now, but if you'll forgive me, I'll live for you. When I got up, I could breathe. I felt different. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? I saw the world in a whole different light. Something happened, and it was, yes, spiritual, but I'm convinced that it was something physical as well. So in light of the second part of your question, does the blood given ever leave the body? I am convinced that something happens in our blood when we are born again. You can take it for what it's worth, but that's, I'm convinced of it. Yes, sir. Bill, I'd like to get your uh, take on uh on the book of Jasher, Chris was mentioning that. On the book of Jasher and also uh, Josephus and his account of Abraham's life, uh, human nature is such that you hear a voice, huh, what, who, you are who? Just like you just said, is that really you? Yeah. And pick up everything and head off to Canaan. Okay. It's interesting to read uh, in uh, Josephus about Abraham's upbringing. Uh, he was in a cave, his mother, and they were take. He, he was hidden, and I, I'm just curious as to what your your take is on this as to. Uh, his Josephus thoughts are on this because it would make sense to me if uh, Abraham said okay well yeah I understand now because I have been brought up knowing you and so when the father speaks to him there would be no question yeah I'm, I'm, I'm yeah I'm on board I'm going any thoughts on that? As far as just Josephus or just these other, you know, for lack of a better term, apocryphal works? In general or just that, you know, Josephus specifically? Josephus? Um, I don't think that we can discount a history of different peoples, you know, that was written down a lot closer to the actual events than what you and I are. You know, he's got 2,000 years, he's 2,000 years closer to these things. Um, I mean, particularly, you know, the things that he uh, wrote about that he observed in his lifetime that were happening right then. And so I just have to believe that a lot of these things that he wrote down had been handed down, you know, uh, oral tradition, what have you, you know, history that, um, for whatever reason, doesn't find its way into, you know, the scriptures. Um, so I wouldn't, I don't discount it. Um, 
sometimes those things can kind of help us understand what isn't written in the scripture. Where Josephus and Jubilees and Enoch and Yasher and, and all these things are concerned, I personally, I'm going to be very slow. To, well, I'm not going to base any doctrine on it. You know, it, it's interesting information. Sometimes it can kind of help clarify some things for us. Um, you know, there's things that Josephus writes about, for instance, in the destruction of the temple and all the things that were happening, uh, signs that they were seeing that aren't recorded in the Bible for us, but I have no problem believing, you know, considering the things that Yeshua said. And so it just kind of adds a little more detail to help us understand things. But uh, beyond that, I... I wouldn't add anything to it. I wouldn't use it as the basis to establish any kind of doctrine or make a decision one way or the other about anything. Um, but I, you know, Josephus is for me anyway. It's not a book just to sit down and start reading. Um, there's a lot of detail there, but I have found it to be very interesting to help me understand the times, the culture, you know filling in some of the blanks of things that we don't quite understand. And I will assume that, you know, um, Josephus had access to documents or information that we don't have anymore. So I certainly won't discount it. So I don't know if I answered your question or not. It's interesting. A lot of those things are interesting. Who's next? Joffrey. Joffrey. Wake up. I'm awake. I'm awake. Um, <laughs> how, how are your sinuses today? They're better. They're a lot better. Good. I, I feel a lot better. I even got to blow my shofar, and it sounded okay. I'm still working on that. Um, let's see. What I, when I read this Torah portion, I was looking at Abraham from a different perspective, I guess. But first, I'd like to mention his name does mean exalted father at first. Mm -hmm. Then the hay is added on there, right. which is for life. And I found that interesting um, because in, if you re, when you read this, you see Abraham is demonstrating the father in a lot of ways. Um, there, there is the time when he denied, he said it was his sister was his, or his wife was his sister, and he learned twice. 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 And, and he learned from that, and he became wealthy after that as well. Um, the question I have is everyone always asks, why did God choose Abram? He's the first who crossed over. He's the first Hebrew. Why, why Abram? So I, did, I was doing some research on that. Um, in regards, who mentioned it? In regards to his brother dying, um, one commentator says that that happened shortly after the Tower of Babel thing. Then Abraham and his brother choose wives. And he chooses his brother's sister, I believe or his daughter. Um, and what the commentary said was this was before Torah was written. Typically when a man dies childless, it is the obligation of the brother to marry her so that his name would be carried on. Abraham marries, marries her, I believe, to carry on his brother's name. It was a sacrificial effort. And I believe he also knew she was, she was barren. I don't think that caught him by surprise. So his actions demonstrated a selflessness, a selfless love. And it, when you follow him, he's patient, he's kind, he hus he's hospitable. I believe he was the first evangelist. He's demonstrating always selfless love. Uh, when he went after Lot, um, he finds out Lot, even after their little skirmish, he goes after him. And we read in the gospel, Yeshua said, if one of your sheep goes astray, you're going to go after him. And so he rescues Lot from the hands of the enemy. Now, of course, Lot goes back. But even then, uh, we see Abraham's character is demonstrated of the exalted father. It's kind of a play on words because God himself demonstrates to Abraham, I am the exalted father. I'm your exceedingly great joy, your exceedingly great reward. And so... That's the, that's the uh, angle I was looking at. The perspective was a legacy. And in so saying that, um, we too have been rescued. We too have a legacy now, a new name. And Revelation says, I will give them a new name. And we too are demonstrating to demonstrate patience, love, kindness, especially as fathers. 
Um, so that's that's the perspective I saw in reading this Torah portion was um, Abraham represents a legacy, a legacy to be taught that we need to learn too. Well, what do you think? We're called uh, one the, more question. One we're more called thing. the seed of Abraham, <laughs> right? And it says that in Philippians it talks about um, Philippians two eight, I believe. Hold that. Thank you, wife. <laughs> well, yeah. No, it's Galatians 3 8. That's right. But in Philippians, it does say, you mentioned reputation. Yeshua made himself of no reputation. I'm going into yeah. the weeds here. <laughs> and Paul counted all things a loss for the excellency of Messiah. And in 3 8, he talks about those are the seed of Abraham by faith. And the, and the gospel was preached to Abraham as well. Right. So. Well, as far as, you know, some of the, you know, like I say, the, the extra information that's out there, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. But to the point that Abraham exhibits a selfless um, character or attributes, I agree with 110%. It's one of the points that I was, you know, making or trying to make this, you know, today is that he'll rather incur the cost of something rather than it bring, you know, some kind of disconnected uh, feelings toward his nephew or his nephew toward him. And so that is a selfless act, you know. And I, I we, we hear about the generosity of Abraham or the hospitality of Abraham. You know, that's a selfless act. You know, he stands by while his guests are being uh, served. You know, he stands by and he waits. You know, he's the, he's the head of the house. You know, but he stands by and he waits. And I think there's a lot to... The, it has a lot to do with the reason that we are called the seed of Abraham. You know, not Isaac, not Jacob. You know, we're called the seed of Abraham because he's the, he sets, you know, short of the Messiah, he sets the standard for how we are to be and how we're to behave ourselves. I think it's in John, it's either chapter 5 or chapter 8, but when Yeshua talks about if you were the sons of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. You know, what were the works of Abraham? These things that you're describing here, this hospitality, this selflessness, this sacrifice. Um, so Abraham is someone to be, uh, his life is someone to be examined, studied, analyzed, and, and emulated, you know. You know, except for the part, she's my sister, not my wife part. You know, that's, that's yeah, well, uh, you know, but it, but it goes back to the, the thing that God doesn't choose perfect people. Never. He's never chosen perfect people. He perfects those that he chooses. And in that, you and I are no different. We're no more, we're no less than Abraham. Because in Isaiah 51, we're told to look to the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and Sarah, your mother, because I called him alone, and look what I did with him. What's the inference? I can do that with you too, if you'll have the same kind of heart toward me that Abraham had, right? And one other thing, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the uh, the tablet, Drew, uh, just to make sure everybody understood what you said at the very beginning, Joffrey. Is it up there? No, there it is. Okay, so this is the Hebrew spelling of Avram. He was called Avram, exalted father. Av is father, Ram is something that is higher, lifted up, or exalted. So what Joffrey was saying is that in uh, chapter 17, he gets a name change. He goes from Avram to Avraham. And the difference is, and I'm just going to insert it here, he inserted the, na uh, the letter He. And so th now that's Av, uh, excuse me, I put it in the wrong place. I'm messing up all over the place today. There's the hay. Okay, so it's Avraham. Avraham. And the hay, this letter here, I'll put it down there, it's the letter that is symbol, uh, symbolic of breath. It's symbolic of the Spirit of God. The idea of hay is hay. And so God breathed into Avram, and he becomes Avraham. Likewise, we have Sarai. But then she becomes Sarah. He added the hay. And rabbis will say, well, those two hay's, you know where they come from? Yud, hay, vav, hay. Okay. So anyway, that's what he was quickly alluded to before moving on. All right. Thank you, Joffrey. Was there something else? 
Probably so, but we've already thrown the bike down the road, okay? All right. Where am I going? I knew. I knew. I just knew. <laughs> Go ahead, Evan. So my question has to do okay, with... Okay, listen. Hold on. Hold on. Before you ask this question, all right. am I going to be able to answer it? Uh, I don't think I don't think it's a hard one. Okay, all right, then go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't think it's hard, and if I go, oh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry, Evan. Okay, so it has to do with the um, covenants that are made with Abraham, um, in, in chapters 15, chapter 15 and 17. Um, so in 1518, it says, In that day Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, I've given this land to your seed from the river of Egypt to the big river, the river Euphrates, um, the Canaanites, the Kenizzites, etc. Um, and then you come over to chapter 17, and it's a different instance of a covenant being made with, with Abram. He's, or this is when his name is changed from Abram to Abraham. But it is in... Um, 17, 8, and I'll give you and your seed after you the land where you're residing, all the land of Canaan, as an eternal possession, and I'll become a god to them. Um, I'm wondering how you, I guess, what is your take on the seeming redundancy between these two covenants? And what, what is my take on what now? Is like the seeming redundancy. Okay. Because he's already made this promise in chapter 15, and then in 17, he seems to make it again, but in the context of a covenant that's much larger. Well, in chapter 17, there's something that he, he brings up that he didn't bring up in chapter 15, mm -hmm. right? In chapter 15, he's cutting the different pieces of the sacrifices and he lays them out and the, the, the fire passes between the pieces. But now in chapter 17, it's a different kind of cutting. Mm -hmm. Even more personal, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So there are some distinctions there. Also, I want you to consider, and I, and I don't know that this is the answer, but in chapter 15, how am I going to have, uh, how, how do I know that you're going to do these things for me? I don't even have an heir. Mm. You know, I've got this guy who lives in my house, Eliezer. No, it's not going to be through him. You're going to, someone is going to come from your, your body, from your loins, or however it's worded there, you know, your seed. And so how do I know that this is going to happen? All right, I want you to go get these animals, and I want you to cut them up, and I'm going to make a covenant with you. And you know, I'm going to affirm to you that I'm going to do these things. All right? And then we get over into chapter 17, and the, in chapter 17 begins this way. God speaks to Abraham, and he says, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be perfect. And we've talked about that word a lot, right? But as far as I can tell, this is the first time that he's ever said this to Abraham. Walk before me and be perfect. Mm -hmm. And now he, he says, I want every, every male in your house is going, to be circum is going to be circumcised. And so he just kind of reaffirms that I am going to give you this land and... But, you know, he's, he's asking Abraham, take it one more step. You know, I want you to go beyond just somebody who walks with me. I want you to be somebody who walks before me. I want you to be Tamim. I want you to be lacking nothing. And there's going to be a sign of this covenant that, that we've made with one another and that you have consented to be part of. So even though it repeats in some ways, there are things that are happening that are quite different as far as I can see it. Also, and maybe I missed something here, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in chapter 17, he's referring to the land of Canaan, but in chapter 15, he was saying all the way from the river of Egypt all the way to the river Euphrates. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, well, I'm sorry? Yeah, I guess that's a kind of another point of confusion for me. Um, I don't think it should be anything this confusing. I'm trying to think of something that can be compared to that that would help me make my point here my mind is going blank i don't i don't think it's a point of con uh, confusion i i just think that um, sometimes the bible will describe something in such a way and then it describes it over here in another way but it seems to be a little bit expanded from what uh, you got in the first place, or vice versa. And I, I just think that's what it is. Um, I, saw you, I saw your hand, so you can probably shed some light on that. But I, I want to ask a question. 
when has Israel ever occupied the land from the river Egypt to the great river Euphrates? So you see there's something a little prophetic in there. And you remember in chapter 15 when he's making this covenant and he's and he's cutting these, these sacrifices and he has to chase the vultures away. He has to chase the birds of prey away. What does that remind you of? Can you think of anything that reminds you of? What? How about the parable of the sower? A man goes out to sow and he's scattering seed. Some falls by the wayside and who snatches it up? The birds. And who are the birds likened to? The adversary who comes to steal the word. So in a similar fashion, what's Abraham chasing away? He's chasing away that that would take, you know, and, and consume that that God's told him to do in, in keeping or making this covenant with him. And then it says that it just this heaviness came upon him and he went to this deep, deep sleep and it was darkness and it was dreadful. And, and so there's something very unique going on here. And this is when he tells him, I'm going to give this land to you and your seed from the river in Egypt all the way to the Euphrates. And so there's something very prophetic going on here that has to do with the end of days. All right, because we've, it's been said, Israel's never occupied all of that territory, right? But God said it was going to happen, right? When? I, yeah, within like a prophetic interpretation, that makes more sense because in chapter 15, it's not a two-way covenant. It's just God saying, I'm going to give this to you, and there's nothing actually really expected of Abraham in that instance. Because then in we chapter get over, 17, you know, you have the expectation of circumcision and all that. Um, well, well, that's, that's kind of, he's kind of committed at that point, don't right. you think? <laughs> <laughs> and not only is he committing himself, I'm going to commit all you other guys, too. <laughs> oh, thanks. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Evan. Uh, what is the definition or translation of the name Adam? Um, mankind is what that word means. May I just show you something here real quick? All right. That's not a very good mem. Don't judge me, Nate. All right, I, need, I need to go to the board. Why is it not showing up? I've written on it. Drew, there we go. All right, so this is the word or name Adam. Adam or Adam, which it means mankind. All right, I'm going to erase this letter. And now it is the word Dom, which is blood. Blood. If I put this letter Aleph back, which is emblematic of the master, Aluf, or the father, if you will, then it becomes mankind, which kind of connects to what I told you a while ago. When he breathed the breath of life into him and he became a living nephish, it's implied that he breathed not only air, breath, but may have breathed blood into him so that he becomes a living nephish. And so Adam, Adam, means man or mankind. It's not just a name of one guy. It's what mankind is referred to at large. That's why you and I are, before we were born again, we were called Ben Adam, son of man, son of Adam, literally. But now we are born again, and to us it has been given the right and the privilege to be called what? The sons of God, the sons of Elohim, all right? Here's just one other little thing, no extra charge. I'm going to put this vav here in the middle of all that. Well, I, I need to make this better. This is a vav, which has a value of six, which is representative of man. And when I put that vav in the middle of that, it becomes Edom. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Who's next? Yes, sir, Jerry. In 17.8 there, um, where it talks about that the, the Father would give the everlasting uh, land the, the, to uh, Abraham's seed for everlasting, it, it, to me it was saying 
that his, his blessings are irrev irrevocable. Because even though Israel did not live in the land, they were exiled from it because of their sin, that the land was after Adam and always will be part of Israel. It would be actually Israel, whether they're there or not, it's still Israel's home. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Yeah. He doesn't change his mind about what he has ordained or determined just because I'm not walking in it. Correct. Right? Yeah. So it is what he has ordained it to be. You know? Now, so I'm, I agree 110%. I will say this, it is, it's, I think it's obvious that when the people have not been in the land, the land does not do uh, what it's supposed to do or what it was intended to do, you know. Um, I think it was Mark Twain who wrote somewhere in the late 1800s, late uh, early 1900s on a trip to the Holy Land that he said, I think this is a pretty close quote, that it was the most God-forsaken place he'd ever seen. And I do believe that that has everything to do with the fact that God's people, by and large, were not there. And so there is a connection between the land and the people, God's people. Um, when, let's see, this would be about 2010, something like that, maybe a little closer than that. But we took a group over to Israel, and I remember Mark McClendon. You, you all met Mark. He spoke last year at Hanukkah. He's uh, the pastor of our sister congregation down in Loosedale, Mississippi. It was their first time to go to Israel, and he just made this very profound statement. We were sitting out beside the Lake of Galilee under a little tent, having a Shabbat service, and um, it was in, um, oh, Bill, come on, Magdala. Okay? And he just said, you know, there's something in the dirt. There's something in this dirt that when God's people are here, it responds. And that kind of unlocked a thought that we can read about in Deuteronomy for one, for one place, is that God says, and I'll paraphrase, if you'll keep my covenant, then I'll send the rains when they're supposed to get here, and the land will produce its fruit. It will respond to my people and their obedience to me. But then the flip side of that is, if you don't do what I say, it won't rain when it's supposed to, and the land won't produce its fruit. The land would respond to their disobedience as well. And so it, I, all of that is to say that, A, it, it isn't revocable. He doesn't change his mind about what this land is for, its purpose, its function, and who it's for. He doesn't change that, and he will have his way. But at the same time, when his people have gone and done their own thing, the land responds to that. It throws them out. They're exiled from the garden again, more or less. So then when, if you see the land beginning to be restored and renewed as it's, as it's uh, doing right now, that would suggest, number one, that his people are re beginning to return to the land. And this is what the rabbis say the ones that are into prophecy, the land's getting ready for the Messiah. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that was a long-winded answer or response. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Ed, Please right? Say, okay, let me get it on. Ed from Reliance. Help me out. Thank you. When Abraham came, came back from retrieving Lot, his family, and all the things that he went up with the 318 men to follow them all the way up to, I believe it was Damascus, to retrieve all of this. And he comes back, and then he's talking about uh, giving a tithe. At one point, he says that the only thing that's missing is is what the men have eaten. Comes to tell, kind of tells me that that the um, provisions ran low, and he must have. He must have had them taken some of the uh, the booty from from the place where they captured the men. Okay. The problem is, if he doesn't take anything, even a shoe latchet, how does he give a tithe of nothing? My math tells tells me that ten percent of nothing is nothing. Help me. 
10% of nothing is nothing. So nothing from nothing leaves nothing. That would make a good line for a song. Um, let's go back and let's, let's read this. I'm sorry. Bear with me. My wife is making fun of me down here. <laughs> All righty. All right, let's see. All right, so verse 16, and he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Cheder Loomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shave, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Avram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Um, and so and the king of Sodom said to Avram, Give me the persons, take the goods to yourself. And okay, so the rest of the story. All right, I don't know that this is the answer, but it says he gave tithes of all before the king of Sodom came to him. So, I don't know. I don't know if that's the answer or not. But he said he wasn't going to take anything. Nothing, Nothing right. So, I, I don't know. Good question. So, this is one of those questions where I'm going to say, I'm going to keep my mouth shut lest I make myself to look like a fool. All right? And then it will say here, in some translations, it will say Abraham gave the tithe. And in another place, it will say he or him. Well, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. that uh, theory that yeah so I, I don't know it's very possible that Abraham could have been given tithes of what he had you know or not that he had taken anything from uh, the, the, the spoils of war I don't know it's a good question I could speculate but that wouldn't be the thing to do thank you Evan I mean Ed I'm just playing that's a joke that you, you just, I know, forget it. I was picking on this young man over here. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, throughout this portion, I've noticed, um, I mean, God making a lot of promises. I will, I will, I will. But something that jumped out at me, and it's in 15, verse 18, where I read in, in my version, it says, to your descendants, I have given this land. Amen. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a done deal. Yes, it is. All we have to do is say, yes, Lord, I'll walk in your ways. I'll follow your covenant. And it's promised to us. That's what, what Paul stated, is you are heirs according to the promise. It's done. Um, as you've often stated and brought up, um, is that, I mean, Yeshua was crucified before the foundations of the earth. The descendants of Abraham were known before the foundations of the earth. We just have to realize it and accept it. Um, I think this was the biggest thing that jumped out of me at this portion is, it's done, we just have to accept it. Selah. Yeah, I mean, agreed. Which goes back to what Jerry was bringing up. Yep. It, there are some things that are, have already been ordained, that it's already been decided. You know, the gifts and the calling of God are, are without repentance. He doesn't change his mind on it. It's a done deal. The choice that you and I have is whether or not we're going to walk in that. Right? Yes, sir. Adam was put to sleep, and then he was multiplied. The, cup, the, the offering that uh, Abraham laid before the father with all the carcasses split, yeah, he was busy about chasing the birds of the air off, but then the father put him to sleep. Because you can't keep this. There's not, you are not involved in this covenant. There's not anything you can do 
this is happening. Just stand aside. And when he come out of that, he was multiplied. He began to have offspring. Okay. Um, the other thing was, is that father stands outside of time. It's not his, it doesn't constrain him. It, it's, it's happening in front of him as he chooses for it to happen. Yeah. So when he says, I have done, or when Yeshua said in our portion, before Abraham was, I am. He said, I am, not I was, I am. He invoked that name. And so uh, that, that really blessed me. The question I have for you, um, Ishmael, the father allowed. He allowed that nonsense to go on in Egypt. And then he allowed Ishmael, because he could have easily intervened there and stopped that. So um, reading in Samuel, I'm wondering, are the, are the Philistines directly tied to Ishmael? Because he's standing outside of time, I'm going to need these people. I don't know if the Philistines <clears throat> genetically, you know, are connected to Ishmael. Uh, there are, there are, as a people group, <laughs> right. who most definitely connected to Ishmael. Right. Um, nothing happens that he doesn't orchestrate or allow well, right? every story must have right that you have to you have to have that chaotic evil you have to have that right you have to have that that good there are some times that I wish we didn't but yeah let, let me read something here and this is what the angel told Hagar he found her by the fountain of water in the wilderness and he said to Hagar, Sarah, Sarai's maid, where are you coming from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply your seed exceedingly. Shall not be, it shall not be numbered for multitude. Sounds very familiar or very similar to what he told Abraham. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, behold, you are with child and shall bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. And he will be a wild man. Yeah. From the very get go. Yes. I, I, you know, there are King James. I won't read the King James to you. No. Okay. <laughs> but it gets like, okay, yeah, I see that now, you know. But he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man. And here's the and the emphasis. And every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. Yes. Which so. Man? Yeah. Go ahead. No, well, that made me think, right? You have the anti, or the protagonist, right? Right. And you have the antagonist. You right? have wheat. Yes. And you have yeah, tares. tares. Come on. Yes. Okay. So Ishmael is the tear. Yes. In, in a manner of speaking, in the midst of the wheat, he's yes. going to be an a, an adversary. He's going to be someone who's going to provoke, you know. And he's not going to be content to just kind of stay over in his territory, Never. you know. Esau is kind of in that same vein, different, you know, DNA, you know, to some respect, but same mindset, same kind of outlook on life. Exactly. So should it have been, was it ordained for it to be, or was it allowed? That's a God question. And I don't know that any of us can answer that. I will tell you this, and this is just Bill's opinion. If Ishmael is the result of Abraham going into Hagar. And if Hagar is with them because when they went down into Egypt, Sarah was abducted by Pharaoh and he felt compelled to give her gifts, you know, to get God off his back, so to speak, and send them away, what would have been the result if Abraham had gone into Egypt and said, that's my wife? Or he had not went at all. Or, or that. No Hagar. No Ishmael. Okay? So in every one of our lives, there is that reminder of what happens when you do things your way, a reminder of what happens when you don't trust me in everything, not to condemn or not to, you know, destroy, but just a constant reminder that remember what happened the last time you did this? Don't do that again, right? So that's kind of how I've, I've kind of looked at it. And so those things do play a role 
in how God interacts with, corrects his people. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm jumping all over the place here. Nebuchadnezzar is my servant, he says. How so? He uses him as a rod of correction. You're not going to do things my way. I'm going to bring the king of Babylon in here. He's going, you, your hearts are already in Babylon, so I'm just going to plant your backsides in Babylon. And he's going to come and he's going to be my rod of correction. After 70 years, I'm going to bring you back and we'll try it again. But he always has those people who serve as antagonists to not destroy his people, but to provoke his people to repentance and restoration. And, and say la, America. I'm not going to go there today. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Hingle. Uh, question and statement, statement first. So Adam, okay. you add a hey to the end of Adam, Adamah. Adamah. So the ground, right. so as man goes, so does the ground. So. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I got you. I just thought that was kind of cool that if we're being obedient, then the ground that we're on is being blessed. <laughs> Again, I believe the ground responds to our obedience or our disobedience. And I, I, particularly where the land of Israel is concerned, I think the principle can be applied anywhere God's people are. That's, that's my view anyhow. And that's, that's kind of what my thought was. Uh, I was thinking first, Adam maybe was created around the land of Israel before Israel was Israel. But then my perspective became broader that no matter where we are, as long as we're being obedient to what the Father is telling us to do, he blesses our footsteps wherever we're at. I, I agree with that. So, um, Just a little footnote. Was that your question? or was That, that just, was my statement. That was your statement. Oh, we hadn't gotten to your question yet. <laughs> okay, so, go ahead with your question. Okay, so question. Uh, Deuteronomy, or not Deuteronomy, Genesis 12, 3. Uh, and all the people's on earth will be blessed through you. That word blessed, uh, I have written down my notes from, I don't know how long ago, that that word blessed is also venevruku. Have you ever heard that? Venevrechu. Venevrechu. From Barak. From Barak. Okay, but venevrechu. Grafted in? In some Mishnaic literature, when it talks about the... Um, the grafting of trees and plants and things like that, it uses this term venivrechu. And so the idea is that in Genesis 12, what it was really saying, or what God was saying to Abraham, in you shall all the nations of the earth be grafted in. Which would then explain why Paul in Romans chapter 11 went into the great explanation he did of about a cultivated olive tree, branches that were broken off because of unbelief, and then a wild branch is grafted in contrary to nature to become one and part of that tree to produce that fruit. And in Genesis, uh, excuse me, Galatians chapter 3, he talks about, uh, Paul refers to that, or you know, at least hints at that a little bit, um, in, in Galatians chapter 3. So... Paul, studying at the feet of Gamaliel, would know these things. He would be, you know, he would have been exposed to these kinds of things. He wasn't just making stuff up. These were concepts, these were things that had been taught and, ta and, and discussed for centuries, right? But yes, um, that term, venivrechu, shall be blessed, talking about the nations of the earth shall be blessed, in Mishnaic literature, is used when talking about the grafting of plants and the grafting of trees. You're not supposed to graft a different kind of species of tree or, or plant or anything like that, you know, um, because you're not supposed to have a field or vineyard sowed, sown with diverse seed. And so that's where that, that concept comes from. But, it, but it's right. That, that's correct. And so, again, that's why Paul, uh, you know, addressed it. You know, hints at that. That's the, he had the gospel preached to him, and it's about grafting in all these nations to become part of this one body. Very cool. Thank you. Yes, sir. I will say something. I was, I was, it, it's neither here nor there, but as it relates to Adam being formed in and around what we now know as Israel, before it was Israel, may I comment on that? Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the belief is, the tradition is, that Adam was formed from the dust of the earth 
from all the different parts of the earth, not from around what we would call Israel, but from all these different places in the earth. And my understanding is there's basic colors of earth, black, brown, red, yellow, pale, white, whatever you want to call it. And so a Sunday school song comes to mind. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. So he takes all this earth and he forms this body and he breathes life into it. Okay. Then he placed him in a garden. So what did he do? He took this dust from all the different places of the world, formed a body, and then he put that body in a specific piece of ground to, and said, take care of it and defend it. And that's where I believe what we now know as Israel, that area, that's where the garden was. There's no doubt in my mind. Well, I wish I had time to go into some of the details of that. Have you ever thought about why when he's, he's making his way into Jerusalem, before he's going to be crucified, he comes to a place called Bedfage, and that's where that fig tree was. Then he was hungry, and he went, and he couldn't find any fruit on it. Had all these leaves put out there, but no fruit. It wasn't the time of figs, it goes on to say. But nevertheless, he's looking for fruit on a fig tree that's got all these leaves out there in a place called Bethphage. Y'all would say, you might say Beth Page. Have you ever looked up what Bethphage means? The house of unripened figs. And it sits on the crest of the Mount of Olives. How many, raise your hands if you've been to Israel. Okay, maybe you paid attention, maybe you didn't. But the crest of the Mount of Olives is the line of demarcation from wilderness and vegetation. When you come down the western slope of the Mount of Olives, going toward the city of Jerusalem, across the Kidron Valley, it's green, there's trees, that's where Gethsemane is. It's the Mount of Olives, they call it the Mount of Olives for a reason. There are olive trees and olive groves all over there. But on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, heading out toward the Judean wilderness, you know what you got? Dust, rocks, things like that. It's, it's almost like there's a line that says west of here, it's green, East of here, it's desert. That eastern slope <clears throat> that's desert in Hebrew is called Ma'ale Adomim. Ma'ale, the ascent, Adomim, but plural. Okay? So I want you to imagine just for a moment Adam and his wife are put out of the garden. Which way did they go? Which side, where were the, where were the Herovim with the flaming swords that turned every which way? Where were they posted? On the east. They were placed there on the east. Later on in the days of the temple and the sanctuary. But let's go to the temple that sat in Jerusalem. What was embroidered on the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place? The Herovim, right? Doing what? Guarding. Guarding the Holy of Holies, which would then correspond in the garden to what? The midst of the garden where the tree of life was. Why were the cherubim posted there? To guard the way to the tree of life. Why? Because Adam, Adam, didn't. He was supposed to, but he didn't. So he and his wife were exiled from the garden, and presumably, since the cherubim were there to, on the eastern approach, presumably they head toward the east. Okay. So if the garden was in the environs of what we now know as Jerusalem, can you imagine Adam trying to get back as close as he possibly could to the garden and yet not being allowed in? And what happened to the ground because of his, it was cursed, right? By the sweat of your brow, you will eat bread. You're going to have to toil. So interestingly, the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives is called Ma'ale Domim, the ascent of Adam's heading up that hill, and there's that line there where it starts turning green when you go toward Jerusalem, and on the top of that ridge, there's a, there was a place called Beth Fage, the house of unripened figs, and Messiah goes looking at a fig tree that's put out all these leaves but doesn't bear the fruit, and what was the man and the woman trying to hide themselves with? Just something kind of interesting. Can I share one other tidbit with you? Thank you, I will. 
There used to be, in the, in the garden, there was a river. And it, when it exited the garden, not in the garden, but when it exited the garden, it divided and became four river heads. And it gives you the name, the Parat, which is the Euphrates, Gihon, the Pishon, and Hideko, right? And so it divides, this one river divides and it becomes four river heads and it tells you where they go, etc. cetera. Um, I have to show you on the, the board. I'm gonna go to the tablet. Are y'all okay with this? All right, I'm going to go to the, the slate here, Drew. Yud, Resh, Dalit, Nun. I know Nate knows. Anybody else? Yarden. Yarden, not garden, Yarden. Or you would say, Jordan, referring to what? The river. Now here's something I read in uh, Biblical Archaeology Review probably 30 years ago. That other than serving as a boundary to distinguish the land of Israel from Transjordan, what's across the Jordan, to the east, the Jordan River really serves no real purpose. Now this is according to a geologist and people who are a lot smarter than I. And I'm just going to boil down what they said and, and share this with you. But it basically serves as a border. It's not a great waterway. If you've been to Israel, you've seen the Jordan. It's, <laughs> it's the creek Jordan, you know, compared to what we have over here. All right? But anyway, Yarden is what it's called in Hebrew. But in the same piece, or this gentleman is saying that basically it serves as a boundary. There's no other great purpose the Yarden serves. However, he said, in the recent geological past, and that is a direct quote that I'm really impressed with myself that I can remember. But in the recent geological past, and I will end the quotes there, he said that within the last five to 6,000 years, there is a geological evidence to, to suggest that the Jordan didn't run directly south from the north as it does now, but that it actually took a more southwesterly course toward Jerusalem, and taking this course, it would have actually transformed the land of Israel into, and I quote again, a veritable garden of Eden, end quote. So now here's something that's interesting. You can take it for what it's worth. These first three letters, Yud, Resh, Dalit, there's a root word there, Yarad. We would say Jared. Yarad. Here's what it means. He came down. If you take the last letters, Dalit Nun, that is Don or Dan. Does anybody know what that means? Yeah. To judge. And so embedded in the name Jordan or Yarden is this hint. He came down to judge. And so if he came down and he walked in the cool of the day with, in the garden and he goes, Adam, where are you? Well, we're over here hiding behind the fig leaves because we were naked and we didn't want you to see us. Says, well, who told you you were naked? Well, that woman you gave me. <laughs> and you know the rest of that story and how God begins to, well, he goes to the serpent and he goes to the woman and he goes to the man. Here's what's, here are the consequences. And things changed. And so is it, is it possible, possible that the River Jordan where everybody wants to be go, to go and be baptized, where Yeshua himself went to be immersed by John. Is it possible that in days gone by that that was the one river that came out of Eden? And I'll throw one other thing out at you. You can I think Bill's crazy. He's lost it. He's gone over the edge. But many years ago, you guys might have been on this trip, Carlos. Years ago when we went to... Didn't y'all go like in 92 or 89 or 90 or something like that? Were you there when we went to the Temple Mount area at the Western Wall and Gideon was, took us over to this place that had put a canopy or something over it and he took us and there was a hole in the floor and he said, listen, and you could hear this water rushing. Do y'all remember that? Okay. This water rushing. When they had begun to do excavations 
underneath the Temple Mount that runs down the what's the western wall. Part of it disappears behind all these buildings, but you can go down in what is called the Rabbi's Tunnel, which is just an excavation that takes you back to the bedrock of Mount Moriah and see stones that Solomon had laid there when they built the first temple and the Herodian stones that are on top of that. You can actually touch the bedrock of Mount Moriah. Well, when they got down there many, many, many years ago, they ran into a problem. As they were excavating, water just kept bubbling up, and they couldn't figure out where it was. They surmised that underneath there was an underground river. And what made that very interesting was that there's a fault line that runs underneath the Temple Mount that goes across the Kidron Valley up the Mount of Olives, and there just happens to be a prophecy that one day his feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives and the mountain's going to cleave in two and the river that you referred to is going to come out from under the Holy of Holies. It's going to go out into the wilderness and it's going to start out ankle deep, then it's going to go calf deep, then it's going to go knee deep, and then it's going to be a river that you can't hardly swim and it's going to go down into the Dead Sea and the waters are going to be healed. Why is all that happening around Jerusalem? Because that's where it all started. Look what you got started, Greg. Look what you look at what you done did. <laughs> or I could be wrong. Anyway, no. <laughs> Who's next? I have the mic. Yes. Um, so I wasn't going to mention this at first. Actually, I kind of wrestled with it because at first the question just seemed really out of left field, but. Going back to the person who asked about the blood transfusions, um, as somebody who's given a lot of blood transfusions, and I just understand a lot about blood in general, first of all, just like everything in your body, blood cells die. So people who get blood transfusions constantly have to get them because the cells will die. But every cell in your body is renewed every seven years anyway. So, you know, the Lord renews things every seven years on a cycle, so take from it what you will, but... Oh, well, th I didn't know. I did not know that. That is very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I didn't mean to hijack the conversation, but that's one of my soapboxes. Mr. Miller. Yes. Um, I just had a couple thoughts or comments on some things that were discussed earlier. Uh, the one was talking about Hagar. It made me they brought her up out of Egypt, made me think that she was their version of the mixed multitude that got them into trouble. Like when the children of Israel right, came up. All right, John, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Okay, I need to speak a little louder. Yes, you okay. do. All right, so uh, speaking. Speaking. Okay. <laughs> speaking of Hagar made me think that she was their version of the mixed multitude that came oh, up out of okay. Egypt. and. Hmm got him into trouble. And the other thing was talking about the two covenants um, made me think I'm glad that Abraham didn't live today and get the two covenants because our version <laughs> of it is, he'd be like, well, that first one's done away with. I can just, I'm just going with what I got now. Okay, Instead you took of, a totally different track than what yeah, I was on. Yeah, I did. I was I? thinking Peter would have a fit, <laughs> and then, you know, he would be brought up on charges of child abuse. But anyway. <laughs> that too. That too. That too, yeah. But just some thoughts. Well, thank you for your thoughts. <laughs> I'm done now. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> uh, who's next? Right here, right here, Bill. Where am I at? Oh, yes. Uh, Abraham and Isaac, or uh, Yishmael. What language do you think Abraham spoke to Yishmael? What language? Yeah. And, you know, Abraham's uh, kind of in the patriarchal lineage of Muslims as well. So yeah. I was curious about that. Um, I am not the expert on this. Um, I will tell, I will tell you some things that I have been told by others who profess to be experts. All right. That's, that's the best I can do. The, um, the language that supposedly Abraham spoke was an old Akkadian style language, you know, which I don't even know what that means. 
But from what I understand, it's not necessarily Hebrew that we would understand today. I don't think it's Arabic either, you know. Um, I will... I'll, <laughs> Years ago in Jerusalem, um, there was a, a group of people in a hotel room. We had a meeting, brought in some folks that lived there in Jerusalem that were uh, scholarly types. And there was a man there who uh, heard someone praying in a unknown tongue. And he interpreted what they were praying, and he said that they were speaking in a language that had not been heard since the days of Abraham. And now, I'm just telling you what he said, you know. And it, it sounded similar to Hebrew, because that's what I thought was happening. But it wasn't quite that, you know. But it was supposedly some old Akkadian style, or, you know, a Semitic language, but not what we would understand Hebrew to be today, and certainly not Arabic. Now, that being said... I I say this on faith, not because I'm smart enough to figure this out, but on faith. I, I believe that there was that original language, and I believe there's a reason that God spoke to Moses and, and gave Moses the words to write down to all of mankind in Hebrew, because I think that was the original language. Now, whether how it's pronounced today is exactly the way it was pronounced back then, I don't know. But I do believe that. And I'm that's in faith. You understand what I'm saying? I don't know that. But I, I wasn't there. You know, I just, I believe that in faith. And then you go to Zephaniah in chapter 3. He says, I will re restore unto the people a pure language whereby they may call upon me with one consent. And so there is going to be one language that is spoken. And I, like I said, just on faith, I believe that to be a pure Hebrew language. Okay? So if I were going to not challenge an expert on this, I would certainly ask an expert, why wouldn't it be the language that had been that had been given to Adam and that had been passed down to through his lineage, why wouldn't Abraham be speaking something like that, a more pure form of Hebrew? Okay, but that's just like I said, that's on faith. That's not on knowledge of anything. Does that make sense to you? Okay, but in terms of, I don't, I don't think it would be anything Arabic, you know. I, I don't know that the Arabic language as we have it today even existed then. I think it's just kind of evolved like a lot of languages have over the millennia. But that was, I don't know that I answered your question. I just muddied the waters perhaps. I don't know. What I think and what I know. <laughs> uh, dangerous. <laughs> All right, who's next? Hello. Oh, hello. Hey, Bill. Hey, um, how's it going, Steve? Going good. All right. Uh, what do you think and know about um, what John was referring to in Matthew 3, 9 with respect to Abraham and the stones? Okay. I'll tell you what I think. All right. Um, John, the Gospel of John says that John was doing these things in a place called Bethabara. Bethabara. Okay, house, Beth, or Beth, Avara. Avar means what? What does Avar mean? Nate? <laughs> Nathan. Right. All right, let's just, let's just slow it down here a little bit then. Okay, everybody knows what Beth or Beth is, right? House, okay. Avar, to cross over. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting to cue Drew. Avar, Ein Beth Resh, Avar. If I add... That good onto the end of it, it becomes Ivri, which is Hebrew. Avram or Avraham Ha Ivri. 
Abraham the Hebrew, or Avram the Hebrew, however it's termed there. But that's what it means. So a Hebrew is one who crosses over, all right? Which, by the way, I'm very, very strongly of the position that Hebrew is not an ethnic term, at least not exclusively. Hebrew is a term to denote people of faith who have crossed over. You know, Hebrew, uh, a Abram was called a Hebrew because he crossed over from Babylon. He crossed the river, the Jordan. He crossed over the Jordan into the land. Okay, but he becomes the father of the Hebrew people because of what he did, not because of his bloodline and DNA. All right, that's why he, it was a function, not a form. So that's why I feel very strongly that Hebrew is not exclusively anyway, an ethnic term. So if you've crossed over from dark to light, from death to life, you're a Hebrew, right? Everybody with me here? Okay, so then, Avara. I'm going to take that yud out and I'm going to put a hay on it. And Avara. So what does Beth Avara or Beth Avara mean? The house of crossing. All right, now, who besides Abraham has crossed that river coming into the land? Joshua and the children of Israel, right? When they crossed over, do you remember any events that took place, kind of miraculous kind of events that took place? The water split, and the waters of the Jordan rolled back all the way to Adam. There is a town called Adam in the Jordan Valley. Where'd they get that name from? Hmm, I don't know. But interestingly, the waters go all the way back to Adam, it says. And so when they are crossing over and the priests are standing there in the riverbank, they've got the Ark of the Covenant, what did they remove from the riverbed? Stones. And what did they do with them? They set them up to be what? So when your sons and your sons' sons come and they ask, what are the meaning of these stones? These stones are witnesses. These stones are going to speak in a manner of speaking, right? They will testify how God brought us out of Egypt, how he brought us through the mountain, he brought us through the wilderness, he fed us with manna, he gave us water to drink, and he brought us into the land true to his promise. And those stones, by sitting there, will be test they will testify, speak, if you will, of all these things that God has done. So if John was baptizing in a place that was called Beth Avara, the house of the crossing, and he says, don't come down here saying that you are sons of Abraham, because God of these stones is able to raise up children unto Abraham. Personal opinion. He was pointing to those stones that Joshua and the sons of, and the, and the children of Israel set up that they had removed from the Jordan River as a memorial of what he'd done. And so what was John doing out there at Beth Avara? The people were coming down to him to be baptized, to be mikveh, right? And then he would turn them around and send them back into the land, having renounced their sins, repented of their sins, turned from their ways and all these things to go back into the land, uh, you know, to, to borrow from Paul a new creation more or less. But I believe he was pointing to those stones. Now, I mean... There's lots of rocks and stones in Israel. Uh, I mean, he he could have been just uh, a bunch of rocks laying around. God can raise up people from the you know sons of, of Abraham from those rocks laying in there. But I think it was a bit more specific than that. He was pointing to something that was a testimony. You've strayed from the God that brought your forefathers out of Egypt, that brought them through the wilderness. You've strayed. You've left Him. You've abandoned Him. You've gone your own way. So God, from these stones, He can raise up sons of Abraham, people who look at those stones and remember what they represent and what they're all about, and in their heart, they have a change of heart. God will use those stones to speak to those people, and they will be quickened by that testimony, and then they will, you know, these will be the sons of Abraham, you know. So don't just come down here with your religious trappings and say that qualifies you. These, look at these stones and what that represents. That's Bill's opinion. I'm a very strong opinion about it, by the way. But that is my that is my view. Yes. Yes, that that is where Yeshua would have been immersed. Absolutely. Which is not too far from where Elijah the prophet was taken up in a whirlwind. It's in the shadow of the hill. Um, last time we were there, 
and I stood in 58 degree water for about three hours immersing people. <laughs> we were right there at that place that is believed that John uh, immersed folks. And let me tell you, if we ever go to Israel and you want to be mikvah in the Jordan, and it's cold, and you stick your toe and say, oh, that's too cold, I will drag you in. <laughs> you ain't going to bring me down here and then change your mind. <laughs> I can't feel my legs. You're coming out here. So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, Abraham not, had nothing to do with making the covenant, correct? I'm assuming that you're talking about the one that's referred to in, in chapter 15. He's the one who divided the pieces. You know, he, there were things he had to do, but it was God making a covenant with him. So I, I'm assuming that that's what you're talking about. Who is next? We're, we're getting close to time here. That'd be Nathan. Nathan. Yes. Slow and easy. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, <laughs> so one thing that was, I'm going to take this off real quick. Sure. Um, one thing that, um, you know, we were talking about the two covenants earlier of that Abraham and the father had in 15 and chapter 17. Um, and in chapter 15, it's like, you know, it's a wonderful picture of the Father, you know, extending His grace for us um, and reaching out to us, even though we haven't done anything to deserve it. Um, and chapter 17, um, it reminds me of how once you go through the blood, you're able to receive that that forgiveness. So when somebody mentioned about how the um, the Muslim line is from uh, the seed of Abraham, technically, no, it's from the seed of Abram. Because it wasn't until after Abraham got circumcised that the, the covenant was made and then Isaac was, uh, came. Um, yeah, uh, Ishmael came from Abram. And so for me, it reminds me of, like, of all the stuff that I've done in the past. Like once I went through the blood, that's, that's the past. That's not who I was before. And now I'm a new, crea new creation in Christ. So I just wanted to share that. Very good. See, Ishmael is the son of the flesh. Isaac is the son of the promise. All right. Very good. Thank you, Nathan. Anyone else? All right. Last call. All right. You couldn't stand it, could you? <laughs> I'm just playing. Now, I wanted to ask, because you had said about those stones being able to speak, and I think you've made reference to this before. Wasn't there a guy who made a device that could, like, somehow a frequency, mm -hmm. go, be able to go back in time to say, or for us to hear the conversations of times past. David supposedly. Vancouver was his name. So was that something that, um, about them stones, literal, or is that a possible real thing if we could actually hear that these stones could actually cry out maybe? Well, well David has passed. Um, it's been, I don't know, three, four, five years ago now. David was probably one of the smartest men I've ever met. Um, he would, he would come over to our house. His, his son is Joe Van Coovering. Joe Van Coovering heads up God's News Behind the News, that ministry. And that's where we met. Uh, I used to speak at all these different prophecy conferences through God's News Behind the News. Everybody, anybody remember that program on television many, 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 many years ago? Ray Brubecker. In an hour that you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Anyway, that was, <laughs> that was Brubecker. But anyway... David was, um, he was a scientist, he was an inventor, uh, he got into physics and all these kinds of things. He, along with Bob Moog, are the ones that developed the synthesizer. And, you know, so he used to hang out with uh, Greg Lake and, you know, em Emerson Lake and Palmer. You're too young. Anyway. You know, when, the, when the, the synthesizer was first, you know, making a splash, I mean, David was very, very involved in that. You can go to the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Institute, and there is an exhibit about the, the Moog synthesizer, and David Vancouver is one of the people who's, uh, you know, honored there. Um, so all of that is to say he was a very, very smart, very intelligent, and a very, uh, uh, a great visionary. You know, he thought outside of the box. I wish I could explain to you what popping a quiff means, 
but it's just way over my head. But it has to do, it has to do with what happened when the prophets could see things that were going to take place. And it has to do with the speed of light, bandwidths, popping a quiff, that they could actually see outside of the, the, in the confines of time. Because as you said, God's not restrained by time. He exists outside of that. His word exists outside of that, even though he speaks into our world. And so all of these things were related to the idea of the prophets being able to see things and write them down as they were, as if they were, and yet they haven't happened yet. Some, things, some of those things still haven't happened yet. But yet we have them in our scripture that, well, it was pointed out, I have given this to your seed, right? It's a done deal. So in line with that, David was reading where in the book of, of Joshua, and Joshua made a statement like this, these stones have heard what you said. When the children of Israel said, we're going to do what God says we're going to do, or what he says to do, he says, these stones have heard. Now, how did they hear? How do stones hear? So that got David going. And then when Yeshua is riding in Jerusalem, and, and the, they're waving the palm branches, and the people are saying, you know, Hoshana, Hoshana, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Rabbi, do you hear what they're saying? You need to stop them. He says, look, if they don't cry out, these stones will cry out. And so stones can hear, stones can cry out. So he theorized that, theoretically, and he proved it with the physics, and I am no way going to try to go down that road, but th he proved it theoretically, you know, with you know, the laws of physics, that inanimate objects like stone, walls, different things, actually absorb sound waves because sound waves don't die. They don't cease to exist. That's why we will be judged by every idle word spoken. That we can. That God will be able to hit the replay button and every idle word that I've spoken, which is a scary, scary, scary thought, you know, he'll be able to do that. How so? Because sound waves don't die. And these inanimate objects like stone can absorb those sound waves. And it is theoretically possible, if somebody had the wisdom and the, the smarts to do this, could could be able to extract those conversations and those praises that the stones around the temple heard when all the different people were going up to worship the king all these different times they would meet. They would be able to replay these conversations, these songs, all these things. So then he, I don't want to get in trouble here. You know these little things you have called iPods and iPads? A lot of that technology is based on the things that David Vancouvering started investigating. He used to carry around a little stone and he'd have, he'd have people, I want you to say a blessing into that. And he'd have people b pronounce blessings into this stone because he believed that that stone had heard those blessings. It had, it had to do with the sound waves that, that that come forth from a person and that stone hears what it's saying and that he was convinced that one day I'm going to I'm going to come up with the the mechanism that's going to be able to extract those sound waves out of these stones he never did you know he passed away but that's some of the things that he got into and he made a he made a believer out of me and especially when I go back and read these things in scripture all right but it I'll, I'm going to take it one step further and then we'll kind of bring it to a close today when God breathed the breath of life into man, and man became a living nephesh. If you think of it this way, you can't speak, sing, praise without breath. Try it. Don't breathe and say something. Don't breathe and sing. Can't happen. Shall the dead praise thee? No, they have no breath. Where did that breath come from? Okay. And so the word, the spoken word, is where heaven and earth meet. Think about what I just said. The word is where heaven and earth come together. Why was Yeshua called the word of God? Heaven and earth are coming together, right? 
Okay. So when someone who has the breath given to them by God uses that to praise, to bless, things like that, that the heavens, Moses said, I call heaven and earth to bear witness to what I'm telling you. They will, they're going to hear what I'm saying. So these, God's creation has the ability to hear all these blessings, all these praises. There's, I could take a left turn and go down a really weird trail that you would leave here thinking Bill has really lost it. But I will tell you from personal experience, I had a situation that happened to me many, many, many years ago that made a convince, uh, made a believer out of me that this is true. There's something to it. Now, whether or not we'll be able to practically see it, maybe not in this lifetime, but there's coming a day when all these different conversations that people have had, and they say, oh, no, I never said that. Oh, yeah, well, hold on. How does that happen? So anyway, I'm rambling now, but, but yes. There was a man that was investigating that, working very hard to try to see if it could be, be manifest practically. Did I answer your question? Do what? It's a fun topic to talk about. That's some of those weeds I don't mind getting off into every now and then. All right. All righty. It is 532. Let's, uh, we got all of our little ones and young folks in here. Did everybody have a good day? I was told that we had about 300 people here today. Is that right? I mean, that includes children, nursery, and everybody. That's a bunch of folks, y'all. Pray, saints, pray. All righty. It's been a good day. I'm so glad to see my friends, Carlos and Carolyn Crockett. It's such a blessing to have you here with us. It's a blessing to have everybody here with us. But I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little sentimental to see my old friends are sitting over there. Um, I'm so glad that you guys were with us. And tell your family we said hello and blessings to them. Ed, thank you for bringing them over, brother. Good to meet you. And all you folks who joined us for the first time, so glad to, to see you. And all you folks who are with us every week, we're so glad to see you too. All right? I am going to ask my wife to come up here and dismiss us in prayer. If everyone would stand, please. I had been contemplating about whether I should ask for a particular prayer for a group of people. And I thought, well, I'll just leave it in your hands, Father. If you want me to say anything, you'll let me know. I didn't expect him to ask me to get up and pray, but I think that's my answer. So we have a group of people. Uh, most of them men that I know of at this point whose jobs are in danger and some who've already lost their jobs. Um, some were not told why. They just lost them. That's not really fair, but God has a better plan. Um, some are being challenged right now by things going on in the current climate and they don't know what's going to happen. Um, but you know what? We don't always have to know all the details. All we have to know is the master. And the master's plan is good enough, whether it's with that job or no job or a brand new job or whatever else he decides to do. So I'm not asking for jobs for these people at the moment. I'm asking for the dismissal of fear surrounding not having a job as we know it, as jobs are and for a peace to come on these people and their families. We don't get to decide what's gonna happen, and I'm glad about that, because his plan is perfect. So when we pray, if you know someone in that situation, and most of us here do, please lift these people up for exactly that, that the dismissal of fear surrounding the situation and for a peace to settle on them and their families, because the Father already knows our heart and what we're asking for in our hearts, and that's his perfect will for each one of these situations. And the best part is we'll get to come back and share the victory story. Amen? So let's pray. Abba, we just thank you for this day, our precious King and Redeemer. 
word, our word, that brings life to us. We cling to that. We embrace it. We claim it as our life. And you spoke it, Father. And it's who you are. And it's what makes us who we are. So much, so rich that we can't even comprehend it. And I thank you for it. Our King, creator of everything, knower of every circumstance, I pray right now that those whose jobs are in the situations we described, whether they've already lost them and not been told why, whether they are in um, the possibility of being lost or it's looking like that may happen, Father, or they just don't know what and they're concerned, I pray that you will provide a fantastic victory story that we can come and we can laugh in the face of the enemy and shout your praises from the rooftops for what you're going to do. And it's going to be so unusual that we can't even create the scenario in our mind. But Father, you have a perfect plan. And I just pray that you will erase fear, that you will just dismiss it and concern, and that you will replace that with peace, with joy, with great expectancy. And just let your perfect will happen, Father. We are your children, and we're asking for your bread. Just plain and simple, and you've already told us what you'll do, so we're just going to rest right there in that, knowing that you will do what you said you will do, because you have been, you are, and you will be. And what else do we need to know? So we thank you for that. And Father, I just pray, as we part today and go our own ways with our smaller families, and that you would bring us back together a blessed people when we come back together as one larger corporate family. And I thank you that during the time that we're not here together in this building, that this family is still interacting. They are still helping each other, that they are still looking out for one another. They have each other's backs. They have each other's plumbing. They have each other's fences. They have each other's children in prayer. Thank you for what you're knitting together, Abba. It is amazing. It is magnificent. And it is something only you can do. So we give you all the glory for it, Father. Thank you for the blessings ahead in this week in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Amen. A very early Shavuot Tov. Everyone be safe going home. Be blessed. Uh, hope everyone rests tonight peacefully. And we'll see you again on Wednesday.